see each and every one of you. I'll tell you, my heart's just bubbling over. A few weeks ago, I shared with the church a need that we had. Uh, I just said, well, our finances weren't running enough to cover the expenses that we had there at the church. And I know, and I've always known, this is a church with love. This church has people that really love the Lord. And I'm so thrilled at the way you all responded to that. I'm going to tell you, it's just, it's just amazing. And, and I, I didn't, I don't, if I remember right, I didn't get on to anybody or anything. I just mentioned that we needed more money and, and the church has really so graciously responded out of love. And I, I just want to say that we really appreciate that. And I know that the Lord is pleased because you people gave out of your heart. And I know that God is well pleased with that. You know, I, I was thinking this afternoon about Sandy's testimony this morning. And that really blessed me. And Mother went home with us after church for dinner. And we were talking about it and how genuine it was and how sincere it was. And it was really from the heart. And you could tell the Lord was really in that. And Mother made a statement. She said, well, she said, that's what pleases the Lord is when we walk humbly before Him. And you could definitely sense that she was humble. You know, she said that she had had hard feelings and she'd asked God to forgive her. She judged herself. And, and man, I mean, that just really blessed me. Her testimony just really did bless me. And uh, I really hope it blessed you too because it certainly did. And I told her after church, I said, Sandy, that couldn't have been as any more perfect if you'd have spent a week outlining it and writing it down and memorizing it. I mean, it was like, it was like she had it memorized, but you could tell that she didn't. I mean, there wasn't any stammering or stuttering. You could tell the Holy Spirit was in it. She presented the gospel in it. And it was just, man, I really didn't feel like I need to preach after that. I believe, you know, we could have just given an invitation, but I felt like I should because there's, <laughs> I don't want to let you all out of here at 15 after 11. That's just against my <laughs> religion. <laughs> that wouldn't be spiritual to let you all out of here early. <laughs> now sometimes I may have to repent for letting you out late, but I'll never, I'll never have to repent for letting you out early. I don't intend to do that. I always preach. I always appreciate the Sunday night and the Wednesday night crowd. I mean, I, I always appreciate it Sunday morning too. But, but uh, the faces are so familiar on Sunday night. I mean, it's just kind of like I don't know. It seems like it's really family because a lot of times Sunday morning we have a lot of uh, visitors, and that's good. But on Sunday night, it seems like it's, it's the family. On Wednesday night, it's the family, and I enjoy being with the family. Something happened this morning that hardly ever works for me. Very seldom in my ministry have I ever been able to preach a sermon that someone suggests to me. Not because it isn't a good sermon or not because somebody else couldn't preach it and do a wonderful job with it or, or, or perhaps it'd be a good sermon for another time. But at, a lot of times during my ministry, I've had people say, why don't Sunday you preach on so-and-so? And it just don't work for me. I mean, the Holy Spirit just don't, you know, it's just kind of, eh, you know. I mean, it may be a good sermon, but I don't feel led to do it right then. But there have been a few times when someone would suggest something and, boy, it just clicked. And that happened this morning. This morning I was preaching on the worthlessness of, worth, worthlessness of self-reformation. And I brought out how that you can't be saved just by reforming yourself. It's, a, it's an inward change. It's a becoming a new creature. And I think a lot of times we, uh, that we Baptists and perhaps other faiths that believe in security of the believer, we become very lax. You know, we, we just, well, we're saved, and so what? Sherry suggested that. She said, why don't you preach on tonight? She said, because it would really go along with this morning's sermon. She said, why don't you preach on why, after we're saved, we should live a godly life? I mean, why do it or why not? You know what I'm saying? In other words, I guess what I'm trying to say, and I'm sure this is what she's trying to say. If not, she can correct me. If once saved, always saved, then why not just live however you want to? We're going to go to heaven, aren't we? And unfortunately, a lot of people do take that view. 
And that really hurts the cause of Christ. But tonight, I want to give you several reasons for why we should live a godly life. In other words, why not just live however you want to? First of all, and really the best reason, and really the only reason that we need, is because God, our Creator, desires it. That should be enough, shouldn't it? Really? Really, shouldn't that be enough? Shouldn't that, shouldn't that be the only, the only thing that should really motivate us? In other words, should there have to be other reasons why we should live for God and why should we should live holy lives? That ought to be enough. Because a Father that loved us, created us, created the universe, gives us everything that we've got, watches over us, gives us food and health, family, and all these things to joy, he desires that we live a holy life. It ought to be enough. Since he redeemed us from an eternal hell, since he redeemed us, and by that we'll not have to spend our eternity in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, just out of gratitude, because he desires it, we should say, I'm going to live a holy life. God desires that. He desires that you live a holy and pure and, and a life of piety. Notice what he says, and I, I'm going to go through this rather quickly, so I'll, I'll, if you've got a pencil and a paper, you can write these down. I'll give you the verses, and, the, and I'll tell you where I'm reading, but I'm not going to take the time uh, for you to look them up, unless you just really know your Bible and you're really fast, you're going to get left behind. In Ephesians' first chapter... Verse, starting with 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So see, it says there the whole purpose of God saving us is that we would be a holy people. And so that ought to be reason enough. Just out of gratitude. You know, we'll do a lot of things out of gratitude for, for our family. Now, we, we all know that we'll do that. Uh, I, am, I, I, I'm, I don't want to just keep throwing flowers to my wife, but I really appreciate... Oh, she's going to... <laughs> then when I get home, she'll say, You always do stuff like that. But I really do appreciate my wife. And I was just thinking today, she, before we went to church, she'd put a roast in the oven and the, all the vegetables and everything and had all of the family out, had mother and Charlie and Robin and Danny and the grandkids and all. And she goes to a lot of trouble, you know. And, and I said, uh, Mother likes coffee and I believe I'll make a pot of coffee. She said, Well, that'd be fine. And I said, Well, I mean, that was really just a hint for you to make the coffee. <laughs> but anyway, I really appreciate what she does. And you know, because of that, because of that, shouldn't I live in such a way that it would please her? For all that she does for me, shouldn't we do that? Just for one another. Just because of... Now, I, I really want to please my mother. I'm concerned about my mother, and I care for my mother, and I check on my mother, and, and I'll do anything for my mother. Because she's given so much to me. She's done so much for me. So if we'll do that for one another in a human standpoint, how much more should we want to please God? Who's done so much for me and has done so much for you. You see, a lot of people don't realize this. Every breath you take is a gift from God. Every, gift, every breath you take is a gift from God. He don't owe you another breath. He don't owe you good health. Praise God for good health. He don't owe that to you. But he gives it to you because he loves you. One thing that's amazing to me, I, a person can be born 85, 90, even 100 years later. That heart is still beating. Now, now think about it. Now, I use the muscles in my arms but they do have rest. I go to sleep at night and they're relaxed. 
But that heart continues to beat and to beat and to beat and to beat all of my lifetime. And I want to tell you something. God doesn't owe you that. He doesn't owe you another heartbeat. Even when you don't live for him, he still keeps your heart beating. He still gives you air to breathe. So just because of his goodness, we should do that. Another reason why we should live for God is because the Holy Spirit teaches us to. You see, if you don't, you're going against the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Look what it says here in Titus, and I'll read this very quickly too. The second chapter of Titus says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You're going against the very teachings of God himself if you don't. It's amazing how that as soon as we're saved, the Holy Spirit, our resident truth teacher, resident truth teacher. You know what that means? He comes in and he lives with you, so he's right there to teach you every day and every hour of every day. And he teaches you to do this. You're going against his teaching if you don't live godly in the world. And I always tell this story, which is a, a, a perfect example of that. I remember Jimmy Minton's brother, Bob. Now, Bob Minton had never been to church, I suppose, or very, very much if he ever had. And while he was a nice sort of a guy, he was a pleasant sort of a guy, he, he, he really could cuss. I mean, he was really good at it. You know, I mean, maybe he went off to school and learned it. I don't know. I mean, I don't know where he learned But he could really cuss. He could just knew how, you know, he could just really, he was a master at it. Some people cuss, they just kind of cram the words in there and they don't fit. You know, Bob, that wasn't that way. He was a master at it. I mean, he could just, blah, 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 you know. He was like a poetry when it come to cursing. But anyway, one night, my father-in-law and, my father-in-law and, all, and I were down there in the summertime. I'll get it straight. Another man and I <laughs> was down at his house, and he had a pickup there, and he was working on his old pickup. It was in the summertime, and we stopped by there, and we started sharing the gospel with him. And while I was there, another man come up and interrupted, and there was all kinds of interrupting. But finally, and, and Satan will do that. You know, he'll do everything he can to interrupt. But finally, they left, and we got to preach to him. And uh, we got through, we invited him to accept Jesus as his Savior. And it, it wasn't dark yet. It was oh, about as much light as we have out there right now. We was all standing out there in the yard, and we bowed our heads, and he asked the Lord to save him. When we got through praying, we looked up, and he said, well, boy, something happened. He said, oh, something happened. He said, I, I felt it. He said, something happened. Well, as I said, he was really quite a one to curse. Now, we left. We didn't tell him, now, here's the way you're supposed to live, Bob. We never said anything. We left. The next day, he was working for someone, and they were stringing barbed wire fence. And he, he told us this. He told us this story. He said, I was out there, and he talks real slow. He said, I was out there stringing up that fence. And he said, I grabbed a hold of that barbed wire. And he said, I give it a big jerk. And he said, slip through my hands. And he said, cut my hand. And I said, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> <laughs> now you used to, boy, he'd just blah, 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 blah. But he cut his hands on that barbed wire and he said, whoop, whoop. Now see, you know what the point is? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you. If you will listen to the Holy Spirit, he will teach you. What I'm trying to say is there's no excuse for living an ungodly life. You have a resident truth teacher that lives right within you. So many times people say, is it right to do this? Is it wrong to do this? Is it right to do this? Or is it wrong to do this? What does the resident truth teacher tell you? You say, well, it doesn't say anything. Well, then you must be quite a ways out of the will of God. Because if you are in the will of God, you will not have any trouble understanding what to do and what not to do. I'll guarantee you that. Another reason why you should live a holy life 
is because you will lose your rewards if you don't. Now, 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, so as by fire. Now think about that a minute. That is an absolute disgrace for a man to go to heaven, so as by fire. I mean, that is taking all of God's grace, all of his power, all of the teaching of the Holy Spirit, and just, and going your own way. So, yeah, they're saved. They're saved, but they get in by the smell of the smoke. I, now, isn't that something? They stand before the judgment bar of Christ all of their life, all of their works, all that they've done has been tried. When they get through, they have absolutely nothing. They have not done one thing for the cause of Christ. They'll get in. But, you know, that's a disgrace, isn't it? You know, that type of a salvation is almost as much to be despised as it is admired. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to heaven that way. Just barely getting in. I mean, by that I mean this: everybody that goes to heaven barely gets in, but it's all by the grace of God. But I don't want to go to heaven without something to lay at the feet of Jesus. You know, my wife does this, and I think it's wonderful. And I know a lot of you ladies do this. And I, sometimes I don't understand the thinking behind it, but someone will say, well, we want you to come over for dinner. Or, what are y'all doing? Why don't we, we put on some coffee? Why don't y'all come over for a little while? Now, Archie and Martina do it. I, I know one time we said, why don't you come over after church? Well, we went home. We kept waiting and we kept waiting and they wasn't there and finally they showed up. And first they went by Homeland and bought a cake. In other words, they like Susie. If you invite them over, they don't want to go over without bringing something out of a common courtesy. Listen, after all God's done for me, I don't want to just walk in and say, I didn't bring nothing. No, I never, I didn't do one thing for you. I just had a ball. Then when I died, here I am. Where's my mansion? That's terrible. That's terrible. Listen, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there because of his grace. But I'll tell you, I want a crown to throw at his feet. My greatest joy, I believe, will be to see people there that I've won to the Lord. As Paul says, they're my joy and my crown. They're my children in the gospel. Oh, won't that be one of say, say, Lord, I know you love these people. You died for these people. Lord, I did all that I can and all that I could to, to share the gospel with them because I know you love them and I love you. And because I love you, I love them. That ought to be a great motivating factor to encourage us to live a godly life, shouldn't it? to be faithful to the Lord. But now let's look at the other side and let's look maybe at some selfish reasons. Because first of all, if you don't live for God, you are going to be miserable. I mean, if you're saved. Well, even if you're not saved, you'll be miserable. I don't believe I ever saw a happy sinner. Not really. Have you ever seen a happy sinner? Now, if, if you say, well, I don't know. Well, go over there Sunday morning when they got the hangover, you know, and their eyes are way out here somewhere. They're not all that happy. But listen, I'll tell you something. If you've been saved, I'll guarantee you, you will not be happy unless you're living for God. 
Why? Because it's against nature. It's just unnatural. It's unnatural for you to live out in the world after you're saved because you become a new creature. You see, here the Bible teaches this, that once you're born again, you now have two natures, right? You have the old Adam nature, but you also have the new nature, and there's always going to be a war if you're not living for God because the Holy Spirit ain't going to give up. Because he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You'll never have any peace whatsoever as long as you're living out in the world. There'll always be that conviction there. There'll always be that old nagging, you're doing wrong, you're hurting the Savior. You'll never really have any peace. I, I was talking to a man one time, and he said, you know, he said, I used to go to the bars and the honky-tonks and the dances, and he said, I'd come home late at night, and he said, I'd be blurry-eyed. He wasn't even saved yet. And he said, I'd be blurry-eyed. And he said, but to go down my street, there was a church. And he said, I could not pass that church. He said, I'd go way several blocks out of my way just so I wouldn't have to pass that church. Now listen, if the Holy Spirit convicts sinners that way, you think he's not going to convict his children? Now listen, there is not a person that's ever been saved that sinned and got by with it, not a one. Every time I do wrong, the Holy Spirit eats me alive. And he does you too, if you're saved. You can't be happy. You just can't be happy. There's no real contentment there. Now, you can go out and feed the old Adam nature, and listen, I'll tell you, while the music's loud and the, and the lights are bright and all this is going on, you can be happy. But I'll guarantee you, when they turn the lights out, whew, there comes that old empty feeling, and there's the Holy Spirit starts convicting you. You did wrong. You hurt the Lord. I'll tell you something else. You need to live for God because if you don't, you'll lose your testimony. And a lot of times losing your testimony involves a lot more than your testimony. If you don't believe it, ask a lot. A lot was a saved man. Some say, well, I don't believe he was saved. Oh, he was saved. He was saved. Definitely saved. If you don't believe it, we'll turn over here to Peter, where I was preaching, I'm not even going to turn to it, you turn to it. Turn to the same chapter I preached from this morning about Peter. It says right there that Lot's righteous soul was vexed with the sins of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says God knows how to deliver the godly from temptation, in other words, judgment. But he knows how to reserve or preserve those unto judgment. In other words, Lot was living down there in Sodom and Gomorrah, and I tell you, he was just as backslidden as he could get. He couldn't get any back, uh, more backslidden than he could get. He had completely lost his testimony. Completely. He had backslidden to the point that when the angels told him, Lot, you've got to get out of this city. God's going to destroy it. He went to his married daughters and son-in-laws and said, Listen, there's some angels at my house right now, and they said that they're going to destroy this city. And they just mocked him. They said, oh, Lot, come on. You trying to tell us God speaks to you? The same as saying, well, you old hypocrite. Now, I want to tell you something. He not only lost his testimony, he lost some of his children, and he lost his wife because of the ungodly life that he'd been living. Listen, you can't live an ungodly life without it costing you an awful lot. Not only that, I think some people even can lose their life. I really believe it. I believe some Christians that refuse to live for God lose their life. And I believe the Bible very clearly proves that. The Bible says some sleep. In other words, some have already died because of the way they were uh, taking the Lord's Supper. We remember Sapphire and Ananias. Some say, well, they weren't saved. Who said they weren't saved? The Bible doesn't say they weren't saved. No word does it say they weren't saved. It just says they lied to the Holy Ghost. They had covetousness in their heart. And Christians can have a, a covetousness in their heart. They can have hate in their heart. But I'll tell you what, you can't have covetousness and hate in your heart and still have peace and joy in your heart. 
Jesus gave a parable. He said this man had a vineyard, and in the vineyard was a tree. And the landowner came through, and he told the gardener, he said, this tree doesn't have any fruit on it. I mean, there it was. It was a tree, and it had the leaves, and it looked healthy. Not any fruit on it. He said, cut it down. Why cumber it at the ground? In other words, why let it take up space? And I really believe this. If you are saved and you're going to live a, live a terrible testimony, listen, the greatest thing God can do for the church who he loved and gave his life for is take you out of the world. Because you're detriment. You're hurting the cause of Christ. And I believe God will do it. I told the story one time. I, we used to, when I was young, young, just a teenager, I was going to Broadway Baptist Church. And we had our Sunday school superintendent of that department and Boy, he was a very energetic man, and I mean, he was just one of these guys that, and the kids just loved him, you know, and, and boy, he, he taught the Sunday school class as well as had the opening exercise, and he always gave a good devotion, and he was very energetic, and so forth and so on, and after I'd grown and left home, well, he, he'd got out of the church, become an alcoholic. I mean, just openly, oh, the whole town, it was such a terrible testimony. Now, he was a young man, even at that time, now, he was probably... 10 years older than I was, maybe a little over 10 years older than I, but I'm talking about when I was 16, 17 years old, too. One day he was off work, and he was working in his backyard, and <clears throat> he got a sore throat. He told his wife, said, I'm going to go and lay down a little while. I'm, I've just I've got a sore throat. He went in and laid down and died. They run an autopsy because he was so young. They have to do that unless you're 40 or over something. They couldn't find one thing wrong. He just died. But yet at the same time, this man had been witnessed to many times. Many Christians had encouraged him to repent and come back, and he wouldn't do it. Now, I'm not judging him. I, I mean, by that, I'm not saying that that's the reason he died. But I'm saying I believe that happens. I believe God will take you out of the world if you are going to be a terrible testimony. Now, I want to get to my... Uh, now... I want to get to my sermon real quick because I've just got five minutes left. Turn, if you will, to Peter. <laughs> Second Peter. The only way that you are going to live, if you're a Christian, the only way that you'll ever be happy is to live for God. It's just designed that way. That's what God created you to do. That's the reason, hey, he gave you the new birth, that you would live a holy life, that you would live a, a life that is well-pleasing unto him. And you will not be happy unless you're doing what you're created to do. You just won't. And Peter here, and I'll go through this very quickly, but Peter tells us how you can achieve this great, victorious, Happy life. Now, let's notice, and I'll begin reading with chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, he said, I'm writing to the Gentiles who have the same type of faith we Jews do that were born again, that were saved, and that have attained salvation through what? Christ's righteousness. That's what he's saying. He said, I'm writing to you. He said, grace and peace be multiplied into you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now let me show you something. Grace always precedes peace, but also, not only does he mean grace like saving grace, but just living grace. And great tranquility of mind be multiplied to you through the knowledge of Christ. Now, here's what I'm trying to say. The more you know about Christ, the more peace you have. The more you know about this Word of God, the more things that you, that you will know and realize that you have access to that will help you in this walk. Because the more you know, every time you study, you will discover new promises in there that you didn't know existed. And I think that's what he's referring to. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. Now, first of all, if you don't live for God, he's saying here there's no excuse for it. There's no excuse for it. He's not telling you to go live for God under the energy and power of the flesh. He's not saying grit your teeth and dig in. And He's not saying that again. Notice 
how you live for God, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know what he's saying? If you really want to live a victorious life, be supercharged with the Holy Spirit. God, listen, God doesn't expect you and God doesn't want you to live a life, a victorious life, apart from the Holy Spirit because number one, it's impossible. You can't do it. Number two, that kind of a life doesn't glorify God. What glorifies God is to take a hell-deserving, weak, powerless man, save him, supercharge him with the Holy Spirit, and then he goes out and lives a victorious Christian life filled with power and grace. That's what glorifies him. And he says that's what God wants. There's no excuse to live a defeated life. Notice. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. Now, is there anything needed there? Is there anything you can add to that? You say, boy, if I just had a little more, boy, if I just had a little more patience. Man, if I just had a little more love. He says he's going to give you all things. All things that you need to live for him. And I'm glad, aren't you? Do you know why we don't have enough love? Do you know why we don't have enough power? Do you know why I don't have enough patience with my wife or she don't have enough patience with me? Do you know why I don't a lot of times have the understandings and, that I should have? you know why I don't have the wisdom a lot of times to make decisions like I should? Well, I'll tell you why I don't. It's not because it's there. It's, not because, it's because I won't use it. I, I, I heard a little story one time about this man that died and he went to heaven and St. Peter was showing him around and St. Peter said, would you like to see the post office? He said, well, sure. So they went to the post office and there's great big bins with names on them and and he said, now, you know your neighbor that you go to church with? This is his bin right here. And it was just full of packages. He says, these are gifts for him. He said, oh, that's marvelous. And so he was going down through there, and he was showing him these bins full of packages. Some had a few in them and because they'd already been picked up, and others were practically full. And he come to his, and there was a bin, and it was almost completely full. And he said, that's got my name on it. He said, that's right. He said, are all these packages, were they for me? He said, yes. He said, well, how come I didn't get them? He said, you didn't call for them. You get the point? God has everything we need if we'll just call for it. You need more love? Just say, Lord, I need more love. That guy's hard to love. Archie, I can't hardly love him, but God give me more love and I can love him. <laughs> Lord, these kids are running me nuts. Give me a little more patience. You see what I'm saying? He said he's got all things so that you won't be defeated. You won't be brought into defeat. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great, not just great, but exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, I, I would really like to go through that whole passage, but I don't have time tonight because that is a wonderful lesson. And I believe I will at a later time. I believe I will because it shows how that, that it, well, there's just so much in there. There is just absolutely so much in there. But he tells some other things to add to your faith. And he says, if you'll add to these things, you'll never fall. In other words, you'll never be unsuccessful. You will be a very victorious, successful Christian. And he ends it like this. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Boy, it sounds good, doesn't it? Man, God will throw them the doors and here you come. That's what he's saying. We'll enter victoriously. Not as, uh, just, not as defeated saints. You know, I, I either saw some pictures or I, I read, the, read a story and and, and a lot of times I'll read something and then I'll picture it in my mind and then several years later, well, I think, well, did, I saw the picture, but I don't think I probably did. But uh, two famous artists were commissioned. One famous artist was commissioned. He said, I want you to paint a picture of the church as it enters the harbor and comes to the shores of glory. 
And so he thought about it, and he thought about it, and he thought about it, and so he did. He painted this big picture. And he showed a, a ship coming into the harbor, and I mean, it, oh, it was in such bad repair, and one of the oars was broken, and, and it had, you know, like maybe 12 or 15 people in it, and oh, they were so ragged, and they were just so starved. They looked like they hadn't eaten in about two weeks, and they were dirty, and their clothes were tattered, and, and oh, they were just, you know, they, they were just really in a pitiful shape. And, and instead of rowing into the harbor, they were just drifting into the harbor, and they were just laying, kind of laying over the sides, just completely fatigued as they got to the shores of glory. Now, ask another artist at the same time, said, we want you to paint your version or what you think of the church that's, as it arrives on the shore of glory. And he saw it all together different. He showed a ship, and man, all the people were just singing, and ha- man, having the best time, and they had all had on new clothes and smiling faces, and, and it looked like they just left first cafeteria. I mean, you know, just fat and sassy, and I mean, they come in victorious. And that's the way it is. I mean, you can arrive to heaven just starved out, no victory, just kind of just drug in by the hair of your head, just kind of washed up on the shore, so to speak. Or you can live by the principles of the body, you can be supercharged by the Holy Spirit, and I mean, you can be more than conquerors. You can live such a victorious and such a, such a profitable life so that when you leave here, you can say as Paul, time of my departure is at hand. I've finished my course. I've run my race, and I'm ready. Could you say that right now tonight? I mean, just ask yourself this question. If the Holy Spirit said, I'm calling you home tonight. What would happen in your heart? Would your heart start going, Woo! Well, wait a minute, Lord. You see what I'm saying? Or would you say, Oh, praise God. I finished my course. Uh, I've done all that God asked me to do. I'm ready to go. See, that's what he's talking about. It's up to you. Now, you can live for yourself if you want to. You can enter heaven just washed up on the shore, so to speak. No rewards, not done anything, lived your life, a selfish life, strictly for your glory, according to the dictates of your flesh, because you're still saved by grace. You can do that. Or you can say, I'm not going to waste the grace that he gave me. Now, I avail myself of his saving grace. Now, I'm going to avail myself of his living grace. I'm going to use all the resources at my disposal. I'm going to use prayer. I'm going to use Bible study. I'm going to look to him for wisdom and for knowledge and for love and for patience and everything and all things that I need so that when I get there, I can walk in with the string of graces victorious. It's up to you. But the question is, why should you live for God? Well, that's why. That's why everybody wants to be a winner. I don't believe I am anybody says, no, I want to be a loser. <sighs> All these people, even in high school, you know, I remember in Garfield, I never was into sports because I don't have two left feet. I just got one left foot and one right foot, but they don't track right, you know. I, they, they really don't. They don't. I never could run real good unless somebody got after me as bigger than me. But I'd, I'd trip myself up. You know, that's just where I was. But I remember in Garfield, they had a contest. They got all the boys out there, and, and then the fastest runner in Garfield got to compete against another grade school. See? And they did it like this. All the fourth graders competed against the fourth graders, and all the fifth graders competed against the fifth graders, and all the sixth graders competed against the sixth graders. And then the fastest one of those three groups got to go to another school, Twin Cities or somewhere, compete against them. And I couldn't run, but I got out there, and I gave it everything I had. I mean, I ran to win. I don't remember one of them kids going out there and saying, boy, I hope I come in dead last. No, you don't enter a race like that. And I'm going to tell you something. You just got one life down here. That's all you got. You just got one shot at it. You can throw it away. You can waste it. Or you can live it for God, victorious, happy, successful. 
and make this life count for something. You see, all this is is just warming up time. You're warming up for the race down here. Did you know it? Do you know what he said? He said, I've given you a little, and I'm going to see how you use it. And he that is faithful in a few things, I'm going to make ruler over many. Do you want to rule in the next world? Do you want a, a, a place of, of great honor, not for your, your sake, but, but would you like a position where you can really glorify God and bring glory to his name over there? Then been faithful down here. But if you don't, just go right on and do whatever you want to do. And so that's the question. Why should I? Why should I live for God? Well, what do you want? Do you want to just wash up on the shores like driftwood? Not showing any gratitude for what the Lord's done for you? So unthankful? Do you want to enter the glory land saying, Lord, I don't care if you want me to be holy. I know you saved me. I know you died for me in the cross, but I don't care. I just want to do my thing. You can do that if you want to. But I don't want to do that. And the older I get, and I'm not an old man. I'm not an old man, but I'm getting older every day. All of us are getting older every day. And I'm a long ways from perfect, I guarantee you that. But someday I will be perfect. But in my limited way, I want to do everything that God has set out and designated for me to do. Now, what I mean, I don't have, I don't, I don't have great ambitions. In other words, I don't want to say, God, I want to preach like Billy Graham. I want to go all over the world. I want to convert the world. No. God, I just want to be faithful in what you give me to do. If it's preaching Calvary, that's what I want to do. Lord, if we never build, if you don't want us to build a big church, you always want me to stay here and preach to these people. Lord, that's what I want to do. I just want to be faithful to do what you want me to do. And that should be our attitude. You see, God builds the church, not me. It's his church. He builds the church. He adds to the church. All we should say is, Lord, if it's your will, we want to do bigger and greater things. But we just want to be faithful to what you want us to do. And, and, and that's my prayer, and that's my desire. I don't have any aspirations to preach at some big first Baptist somewhere. I just don't. If God wants me to, fine. I preached in a lot of little churches, and somebody can testify to that. I preached in churches that wasn't near this fancy. Some of them can testify to that. And I don't care. You know why? Because I, I was where I felt like God wanted me. And I'm saying all that to say this. There's a lot of things I don't do for God that I should. And I'm convicted too. The Holy Spirit gets on to me a lot. Maybe more on to me than he does on to you. But why should we live for God? Because he desires it. Because the Holy Spirit teaches us to. Because there's a payday someday. And because you're not going to be happy unless you do. Your life's going to be a total waste. And it's just going to be down the tubes and you're going to know it and when you get old you're going to look back and say oh I wish I'd have lived for God I know a woman I'm going to close with this because it's 10 after 7 but I know this uh, there's a woman that I knew for years and years and years and she died of cancer on her deathbed she shed